Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Calvin Cater of Great Fights Now Means Bad Fights Later, Jack Slack, it's the Jack Slack Podcast, and we're coming at you following UFC 300, one of the best events I've seen in a very long time, maybe ever, you know, it's Pride Bushido 6, UFC 217, there's a few, but this is definitely in the, uh, the pantheon of greats. Bang a card. I mean, you know, this is the thing. Everyone knew it would be a banger card because you can look at bookings and go, that's good, that's good, that's good. That will probably yield a good, interesting fight, Um, which is also why we can look at these Apex events and go, that's not great. But no Apex today, which means I'm skipping my usual positive thing that happened in combat sports that isn't UFC at the Apex segment and going straight into just how hard this card went. What a fun night of fights. Almost, I, I think, ev- um, was there a bad one? No, even like Holly Holm, by losing decisively, prevented herself from stinking up the card. Even Alexander Rakic came to fight. It was fantastic. Now, people said that everyone would because there was a $300,000 bonus on the line. But yeah, do that every card because you got the money and we need more of this stuff. What should we do first? I mean, it's tempting to do Holloway Gaethje first because it was just so fun. Um, I'm going to get into Suruki and Oliveira later and we'll talk some, like, fine point techers stuff. You can you can fade out if that's not your sort of thing. I'll prob- I'm going to try and get that segment and I'll uh, match it up with some choppy footage of the fight that I can put on YouTube without them getting mad about and drop that later in the week. But uh, that was a, a terrific fight too. What was I mean, aside from like Bo Nickel running through Cody Brundage in the in the least convincing way for a matchup that he was definitely supposed to win easily, um, this card was banger. Let's go from the top. Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. I said on the preview of last week's boycast and also on the boycast, I said this fight intrigues me. I said, you know, there's more to it than just like, you know, big man go bonk. <laughs> I mean, it's two big men who want to go bonk, but... Uh, there was some stuff we talked about. I was saying Jamal Hill, he likes to switch hip. I'd like him to stay southpaw because then at least his shoulder is protecting him from that lead hook a little bit because that lead hook is the dim mark. The dude has the death touch. He's got one of the best left hooks ever. If you've never read my Advanced Striking 2.0 and you're a Patreon boy, go read that for Alex Pereira because um, I talk a good deal about the left hook there. But to be honest, I was mainly talking about his left hook Uh, Well, in kickboxing, he used his left hook a lot as a counter because the left hook is the king of the counters. And to get a really pure body weight behind it left hook, uh, you want to be going from your left foot to your right foot weight wise, which also means going from your front foot to your back foot. So really good left hooks, like the the absolute purest. When I'm saying pure, uh, that's body weight, as much body weight as possible behind the blow. They are quite often delivered sort of fading away. So Alex Pereira used to do like right high kick or he used to do low kick and then uh, step back and left hook. And then guys very quickly worked out that they didn't want to chase him on the low kick. So he started throwing right high kick and then people just sort of forget. They go, oh, he tried to kick me in the head, the dirty bastard. And then they run in on you and get left hooked. But some of his most recent work in MMA has been left hooks going forward, which are they can be more difficult to get power into. They you know, in terms of punching purity as in body weight behind it you are throwing a punch from left to right while also trying to advance onto your left foot. So there are mechanics that you can use to get some power in your hook, obviously, because Alex Pereira has been smoking people with it, but it's not as stiff as if Jamal Hill was chasing him and then got left hooked, you know, as, as Pereira was fading back onto his right leg. But one of the things that I think a lot of people saw coming was Jamal Hill, long stance, bounces in and out a lot, and if you watched his fight with Ovin Simpru, just his legs are always there to kick and he doesn't do anything about it. And his answer to being kicked in the legs was to try and like stand firm on the lead leg, take it and throw punches to the body, which I like coming back from uh, from low kicks with or anytime the opponent kicks. If you can get in on his body while he's on one leg. Great shout. Tyrone Spong used to be amazing at that in kickboxing because it makes sense. You know, when it's hard to get to people's body generally in uh, combat sports because they're moving around all the time, you have to get quite close to them. When are they least likely to be able to move their body away from you when they're on one leg or when they're recovering their leg from kicking? So he did that pretty well against Ovin St. but he was still taking the kicks on the legs all the time. And we've just watched Alex Pereira versus Israel Adesanya, Jan Blachowicz, two guys who are great at checking a low kick 
and and gave them trouble with his low kicks. And then he fought Jiri, who is terrible at checking low kicks. And basically, I mean, it was kind of like Jiri's fight, which we'll get onto in a minute, on UFC 300 against Alex, Alexander Rakic. Um, Jiri's trying to fight while also contending with low kicks that he will never defend. It's like he's got to finish the fight before his legs collapse. And his legs were basically collapsing at the end of round one against Pereira. So there was always this, like, Pereira's going to kick him in the legs. What's Jamal Hill going to do about it? And the the impressive thing that I've seen from Pereira is that, this is something I talk about a lot, but the calf kicking, everyone learns how to calf kick because when you're orthodox versus orthodox, you can throw your right leg to their calf from a long way away. You can run up into it. You can feel very safe in that MMA sort of way where we don't really want to stay in trading range. But then if they meet an opponent who's southpaw, or if, or if the opponent takes a couple of good calf kicks and changes legs, they suddenly don't have a calf kick anymore. Whereas if you have an ounce of sense, you train to do step-up calf kicks with your lead leg as well. And I, there's very few people who are good at it, like Arnold Allen, Roman Kopolov. There's a couple of others, but most MMA fighters are still like massive hole in their game if you switch stances or if you happen to be the opposite stance to them. Alex Pereira is very good in that He's got this weird calf kick, which I did a video on, by the way. Go check on my YouTube. It's called uh, Filthy Casual's Guide to Alex Pereira and Kicking Weird. Because he throws his kick not into the leg, but like upwards against the leg with the inside of his shin. So that it's very hard to see coming. And he holds his shoulder back too. So he's, he's really like last second you see it. And you go, oh no, oh, I've been kicked in the calf. But he can do that off his lead leg as well. He steps up with his rear leg and he throws his lead leg upwards on a diagonal and uh, slaps the outside of your lead leg with his inner shin or ankle. And he hit a couple of those on Jamal Hill, and Jamal Hill did not like it. Uh, and then Jamal Hill hit him in the dick with a kick, and Pereira went, hey, you kicked me in the dick. And just as Herb Dean's stepping in, he goes, hold off, I've got this. And he, he then steps in as Jamal Hill's along the fence. And I think the plan was probably to sort of fluster him a bit. I don't think he could have expected anything like the results he got because he stepped in with a, a left hook and it was quite a conservative left hook. If you watch him against uh, Sean Strickland when he knows he's got Strickland because he's thrown like three body jabs and Sean Strickland's been doing that thing where he gets up on one leg and reaches down towards his belly with his right hand. He's standing on one leg with his chin up in the air and his arm away from his chin or his, uh, his arm away from his guard and Pereira goes wide and swings it way out to get as much stank on it as possible. This one, he steps in with his elbow quite tight. He throws it almost like a shovel hook, which is a term that people very rarely bring out and often mean completely different things. But it, the hook's thrown with the elbow tight, often on sort of like an upward angle. And the reason that it landed so well is that Jamal Hill tried to punch back. He tried to throw his left straight. And that right shoulder that I said, you know, if you stay southpaw, your right shoulder should protect you a good amount from that danger of the left hook without you having to see it coming. But as soon as he threw the left straight, his shoulders square up, his right shoulders away from his chin. He has his chin up in the air a lot anyway. And the left hook just comes in and it's like pinky knuckle and ring finger knuckle. The old Jack Dempsey power line. Um, also, you know, you can hurt yourself hitting like that, but doesn't even get all of it, but it just hits him on the chin and uh, Jamal Hill goes down, follows up with some punches in sort of a leg drag position and then stands up and does a meme gesture. <laughs> Gives us one of the great uh, knockout photos. But man, what a shot. What a performance from Alex Pereira. Uh, I think this is one of those ones where, because it went so quickly, I mean, three minutes actually it went, but there wasn't an awful lot happened up to it. Um, because it happened so quickly, Jamal Hill's going to have a very hard case to get a rematch ever against Alex Pereira. We didn't really see it unfold that far. He never attempted like a, he ma never made like a good faith attempt at a takedown. I don't think he even faked a takedown at any point. But, um, you know, he didn't bring out like a rounded game. He just got kicked in the legs a few times, kicked Pereira in the dick, and then got knocked down. I, I'm not on the, I'm not on board with the like idea that standing and banging with Pereira is just off limits and everyone, even like Israel Adesanya, should be shooting takedowns all the time. Um, there's been enough people in kickboxing and MMA who've had some success on the feet against him. In kickboxing, there's been a, a number of different styles have had success against him, from Belgawi, who is uh, a, a couple of inches taller than him and fought long and switched stances lots, to someone like Vakatov, who basically just kept his hands tight and he would 
body jab his way, like not even body jab. He, I mean, Pereira threw a couple of body jabs in this one. I love Pereira's body jab. But he'd, he'd throw like a jab to the chest about the height of his shoulder because he was like a head shorter than Pereira. He'd throw this jab to the chest and keep stepping in and pushing Pereira back. And then he'd corner him against the ropes and start swinging from there. But then, of course, you've got the danger of the left hook as you're opening up and swinging on him along the ropes. Or cage, in this case. But, um, yeah, you know, he's a... He is a guy who could be moved around. If you watched him, like he did in this fight, I was talking about it, like how he does these long ass retreats, and he did this long ass retreat all the way back to the cage, and then Jamal Hill just sort of like let him circle around and come back. And it's like if you were fighting in the smartest way against Alex Pereira, you would be trying to make use of that. You'd be trying to go, okay, well now he's in the fence. I can at least if I, if I can't get the takedown, I'll at least tie him up there and wear on him a bit, you know. You're trying to take every little advantage you can. And if someone backs themselves onto the fence quite a lot or goes back on a straight line quite a lot, that's always a good one. But um, one of the really interesting things that you saw in this fight was uh, I, I love Alex Pereira's stance. It's so I've talked about it in my article before, but it's so square and his hands are up making a window. So when he's going backwards on a line like that, Jamal Hill's throwing these straight shots at him and they're having to go through Pereira's hands. So even if he can reach Pereira, who's you know so tall, so long, and leaning back and retreating, uh, Pereira can still just bat his forearms and, and take the shots out of the way. And by getting people to fire through that window, he also sets up that beautiful counter left hook, which he, I don't know if he caught uh, Jamal Hill with any of them, but in his kickboxing days, definitely, he'd have his hands out wide in front of his shoulders rather than in tight in a guard, and the opponent would throw like the right hand through the middle, and he'd just left hook across the top because he was already square and his hands were already outside the opponent's shoulder. Going to be talking about line a fair bit in uh, the Max Holloway, Justin Gaethje stuff. Um, actually, you know what? Let's just get into that. Max Holloway, Justin Gaethje. What a fight. I didn't see this coming at all. Um, Max Holloway is such a wonderful fighter because while he's not this is the thing, we're always talking about rounded and how r the idea of well-rounded changes. And I always use Frank Shamrock as the example where he like he had a punch and a kick and a takedown and he was quite good on the ground. And people were like, oh, he's so rounded, I can't imagine anyone beating him. Whereas now we're talking about like, if you're a good striker, grappler, wrestler, there's still parts of each of those games that are exploitable or things that you don't do in parts of each of those games for everyone. Max Holloway's striking, he has so many tools that he can really... You know, I'm always talking about like messing with the sliders. He can go more kicks, less kicks, more bodywork, less bodywork, more jabs, less jabs. You know, he can really change who he is while still keeping all the things that he uses in every fight. More front kicks to the body, more front kicks to the thigh. He's got so many tricks. More stance switching, less stance switching. The start, the length of his stance. I mean, the stance is something that's really important in this fight, in the Aldo fights, in the second. Volkanovski fight, when he's concerned about the low kick, Max Holloway fights very differently to when he isn't concerned about the low kick. When he isn't concerned about the low kick, he's the best boxer in UFC, baby. And he's fighting long, and he's stabbing his lead leg in right next to yours. Um, when he's concerned about the right low kick, go back and watch his fights with Aldo, watch this one, uh, watch the second Volkanovski one where he fights a lot shorter. But he fights in what I, I think I call it like a wire erp stance, because he's so bow-legged. But He's not upright, like in a Muay Thai sort of context. His stance is short, but his legs are bent. So it's almost like he's ready to start sprinting. But he is much more compact. His uh, lead heel is only a little bit further forward than his rear toes. He's often up on the ball of his back foot and his right leg is bent, so his knee is down. And then um, the line is what I was going to talk about, both against Aldo and Gaethje. You know, if you want to box someone, if you want to get in with your jab, if you want to be behind your lead shoulder, you're often trying to get your lead foot down the middle between their legs. Especially when you're jabbing in. If you're trying to open up with your right hand and then slide out to the left side, you might step slightly forward and to the left. But most of the time when two people fight, the lead feet are there, and your lead foot is often inside the line of your opponent's rear foot. Max Holloway fought a lot of this fight and the Aldo fight with his lead foot about on a line or outside of Justin Gaethje's rear foot. So he was almost like standing slightly off to the left of where he would normally be. Holloway's left, that is. Off to Gaethje's right. And that makes it very hard to throw good, powerful low kicks uh, without landing early. And that's a lot, you know, a lot of checking kicks, a lot of blocking kicks 
if you pick your leg up to check a kick or you stand there and you take it on your forearms and you are at the point where the kick was going to terminate anyway, your arm or your shin is just a heavy bag. A lot of good blocking and checking is moving the block or check out into the kick, catching it 80%, 70% through. So if you're already standing off to the side, you've taken a little bit of, of the comfort off their kick anyway. And his lead foot was always pointing forwards or even slightly out so he could bend his knee and take the kick on the, uh, if it was coming for the quad, if it was coming for the the thigh, he could take it on the quad. If it was coming for the calf, he could take it on the shin. And he was always in good position, ready to take it. And there were a couple where he got out of position where he did his boxing and then tried to back out. And that's when his feet would be in a more um, malleable, kickable position, not in a good ready for the kick position. Uh, I mean, that's that's where you've got to catch people with low kicks when they're not ready for them. You, you, I mean, we'll talk about this with Zhang versus uh, Yan Xiaonan, but huge difference between kicking someone on the counter and kicking someone just like naked in the leg. You know, they if they've got any sense, you're not going to get naked low kicks off on someone and actually hurt them. And this was one of those ones where people got mad about the Rogan DC narrative because they decided quite early on that Max was taking a lot of low kicks. If you look at the stats on something like Fight Metric, uh, who I also, I think they also do the official UFC stats. So Gaethje connected something like 33 out of 36 kicks. Max Holloway was not withdrawing his leg and letting the kick swing through. But Max Holloway was not getting hurt by these kicks most of the time. There was a bruise forming on the outside of his calf by the end of the fight, but certainly not like when Rogan was going, oh, his leg's mangled. He's having trouble walking. You go, no, he isn't. He's doing exactly what he did before. And this is a dude who can comfortably change stances and is choosing not to, where most fighters get kicked in the leg a few times and they're not comfortable changing stances and they'll still switch to southpaw and fight awkwardly from there until their uh, leg feels better or until they get finished. The lesson from the second Dustin Poirier fight was get to the body earlier because Max Holloway was successfully hitting the body in the later rounds and starting to get back into the fight. And you're going, if you just started doing that earlier, you could have won this one. So from very early on against Justin Gaethje, he's getting to the body. He's going with the right hand to the body. There's some really interesting stuff in this fight because Justin Gaethje has always been a very sort of feely fighter. He does a lot of like reaching with his lead hand. Um, which results in some eye pokes in his other fights, but we're going to get into eye pokes. I mean, it was Max Holloway, unfortunately, who did two eye pokes in this fight. But he tends to do some feeling with his lead hand and grab him behind the head with the lead hand. And his lead hand isn't really jabbing much until later in the fight when he goes, oh, I'll try jabbing, and it works. Um, But when his lead hand came away from his body, it made him the perfect mark for Max Holloway's right straight to the body, which isn't knocking anyone out immediately. But you can watch some of the hardest dudes in MMA take it a few times and start reaching for it and making, you know, what you would call mistakes, but it's like a good body jab. If they let you have it for free, you just keep hitting them in the body and they're going to get tired eventually. If they start reaching for it, their defense changes and the stuff that they were ready to defend upstairs is suddenly open. The other one that Max snuck in under that lead elbow was the right body kick, which is... Uh, it's a technique that you don't see an awful lot because there's so much risk of it being caught because it also hits the back and and ends up under the opponent's arm. It's not as damaging as a kick on the open side. But if you slot it in at the right time, it can be a very useful kick because it's not something you see all that much. Superlek is very good at it in uh, kickboxing and Muay Thai. But an example of why you wouldn't do it unless you were very confident in your timing would be Paolo Costa when he fought Israel Adesanya. He'd been fighting all these southpaws, so he's throwing right body kicks. They're banging into these guys' bodies. It's hitting their arm or their rib cage, and they're just folding. Then he fights Israel Adesanya, and Adesanya stands orthodox, and he throws the same right body kick. Adesanya takes a little step to take some stank off it, because you either want to stop it early or make it go too far so that it loses some power. So he takes a little step away from the kick, lets it hit him in the back, wraps his arm over, and comes back with a three-punch combination and and drops Costa. And then he did it again later too. Um, So yeah, if you're not good with your timing, the right body kick can be real dangerous. But Max landed some really good ones in this one. And then later, when uh, Gaethje was keeping that elbow down, concerned about the right straight to the body and the right body kick, uh, Holloway would start throwing right high kicks. From very early on, Max Holloway was showing the jab. And as Gaethje ducked to then come back with his right hand across the top, he'd hit him with the uppercut. And the uppercut was a constant feature in this fight. It was a, it was a really good weapon in the second Volkanovski fight, um, but he'd throw the right uppercut to try and catch Gaethje ducking. And he'd also throw the right uppercut as a lead and follow with the jab, which is something I talk about a lot. 
Uh, Willie Pep used to do it. John Charles Skarbowski did it a lot in Muay Thai, which was very unusual in Muay Thai to throw the right uppercut and then the left jab behind it. But it's it's a great move because it clears the space between you. You know, there's, it's very unlikely there's going to be a knee or an uppercut coming up if you've just thrown your uppercut through that space. But they're also going to be standing straight up. So if they don't get hit with the uppercut, which they probably won't if they see it coming in, if you're leading with it, you follow with the jab and you've got a great deal more reach on the jab than you do on the right, or, you know, with your left jab than you do with your right uppercut. Um, so you can snap their head back with a good power jab. And then later in the fight, uh, Holloway landed a couple of right straight to left jab, the the old Sergei Kovalev special. Ko- Kovalev used to drop people with his jab, and people would go, oh my God, how powerful is he that he drops people with his jab? And then you actually watch his fights, and it's because he's always leading with his right hand as like a fake. He smacks it against their guard, and that coils his shoulders, loads him up, so that basically his left jab is now a left straight. Archie Moore used to call it his left cross. But, you know, you, you throw your right hand, so you've coiled your shoulders up. You're standing close enough that your right hand is hitting their guard. So you're going to go all the way through their head when you throw your jab. And Holloway landed a couple of those in, like, round four and five, and they, they were very cool too. But the body jab was there. Love the body jab. Always a great one from Max. Um, you know, if you if you need to see that in action, I mean, you've just seen it against Justin Gaethje work a ton, but go watch him do it to Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo's half the reason that we don't do the body jab in MMA because one time someone tried to body jab him in WEC and he kneed them in the head because he was really good at timing knees back in the day. And consequently, everyone in MMA has always been like, I don't want to body jab because I might get kneed in the head. But Max Holloway came out against Jose Aldo in two fights and by fainting and faking and, sh- and showing the body jab and not doing it and then doing the body jab, you know, Jose Aldo doesn't want to be throwing knees as hard as he can at thin air because then he's out of position. You can come in on him while he's on one leg. He's also tiring himself out. So he'll stop doing it if you show a couple of feints and then you can start poking him in the body again. Actually, one of Gaethje's best shots in this fight was like body jab and come up with a left hook into the right straight. Justin Gaethje, I mean, I say it every time, but if he just understood how useful the jab is, because he's got a good jab. And he never uses it. It's like, I mean, Cody Garbrandt was also on this card and that's been the story of his career. It's one thing to realize how good the jab is and not have a good jab, but to be blessed with a good jab (laughs) or, you know, to have practiced a good jab in the gym and then just discard it as soon as you get into the fight. That's really frustrating. But there were lots of body kicks as well, front kicks to the body, which is what I'd been asking for in the pre-fight. I I liked the idea of front kicking into stance uh, stance changes, but Holloway didn't really stance stance switch that much in this fight. Um, but the one that was really surprising here was the right front kick, sort of teep push kick to the front of the thigh, real like strict Muay Thai style where they don't like you kicking the front of the knee, um, but you are allowed to teep the thigh and he'd go whole of the foot on the, on the quad basically. So heel down by down towards the knee, toe up towards the hip. And he just keeps slamming that in, not even slamming it, poking it in as Gaethje came forward. And you could see Gaethje's hips go back every time, like it being folded in half by this kick. And that one, Bobby Green's teep to the gut, um, Sean Strickland's teeps throughout his fights, they really go under the radar. People don't notice them because all that happens when you land one is that the other guy goes, oh, that's annoying. But it really wears on them. And just like with the good oblique kick, if you hit someone with a good teep to the front of the thigh and you push their hips back, they're all out of position. They're going to have a real hard time getting to you with punches immediately afterwards. Try straight, you know, try standing in a stance and then straightening your leg and putting your butt back and like leaping forward with the left hook from there. You're not going to get to someone. Whereas, you know, Max's stance in this fight, we, the, the legs bent, coiled underneath him. He was already ready to leap in to his boxing combinations. Reminded me kind of of uh, Brandon Moreno's stance against Kaikara France, which I really liked in that fight too. Shortening the stance, but staying bent-legged and coiled. Um, it's hard work on your legs, but if you can do it, you've got a lovely middle ground between being able to level change and stop takedowns, being able to check kicks or take kicks, and being able to spring forward and, and start boxing effectively. The other one was the jumping back kick or just the back kick generally. I, I mean, I'm going to have to write Advanced Striking 2.0 Max Holloway because he's got so many tricks. But we, we, I've talked about this hundreds of times in articles over the years. The back kick or spinning kicks generally, there are a couple of good times to land them. And then every other time is a terrible time to attempt them. Don't do them chasing people. Don't do them at random out in the middle of the cage. The times to do them are against the cage 
when the opponent is very clearly circling one direction into the kick or when the opponent is coming forwards as an intercepting counter. Those are the times to hit the spinning techniques. When they're along the cage, if they stand still, they're going to get hit with the kick because they can't retreat. You've also got a 50-50 chance because if they step one way or the other, 50% of the time they're going to be moving into the kick. So if they stand still or move in one direction, they eat the kick. If they move the other direction, you miss the kick. But, you know, that's why a lot of the time you want to wait until the guy starts circling and then throw the back kick. That's the second time when they're circling into the kick. And if you saw the a couple of the ones that Max hit out in the open, it was because Gaethje was circling past his lead leg. And then the third one is when they're coming in on you. And Max did it along the fence in the first round. And the, the thing about these back kicks is great one to, you know, a great one to study for short range back kicks is Kyokushin Karate. Uh, or knockdown karate of any time because they they exchange punches chest to chest because the the body punches are illegal head punches are illegal which is a really weird rule set but it does make these fighters who have these crazy dexterous legs and the the back kick in real close distance is a sort of signature weapon of knockdown karate so they jump up and they they throw it not like a side kick but with the knee pointed towards the floor and the and the leg bent and coiled right up so you're hitting with your heel basically underneath your ass, but the heel's hitting them in the liver. And that's the ideal connection. But Gaethje ducked forward, as Max had been exploiting with the uppercut the whole time. Uh, and he ate the kick basically down the bridge of his nose, which was a really weird connection, but it broke his nose and messed him up for the rest of the fight. There's been a few weird ones like that, like uh, Uriah Hall versus Musassi. Um... Oh, Eddie Wineland was putting on a great performance against Henan Burrell when Henan Burrell was champion. And I used that to write, or I used a lot of that to write uh, Killing the King Henan Burrell, which then TJ Dillashaw and uh, Dwayne Ludwig, they basically used all the stuff from that. And then they read the article and were like, that was brilliant on Rogan, which was great. But um, Eddie Wineland was having this storming performance against Henan Burrell. And then Henan Burrell, like when he, he was the kind of fighter where if his jab and his low kick weren't working, they were his main weapons he would attempt a really bad takedown with his head out. And if that wasn't working, he'd back kick. And it was so readable that I pointed it out from this Eddie Wineland fight, and then TJ Dillashaw fought Head and Brow twice, and every time he was ready for the back kick and would jump past it and hit Brow from behind him. Um, but Brow did this back kick against Eddie Wineland, and Eddie Wineland ducks, and the back kick was going into the body, but because Eddie Wineland ducked, it hit him in the chin and knocked him out. And you get this incredible knockout that could never have been planned. But that's fighting. You know, we talked about with Alex Pereira in the main event. Sometimes you hit a guy and it's much better than you thought it would be. But the little jumping back kick, especially when backing up, I really like that. There was a really good example from, oh, um, Anthony Pettis, when he was defending the UFC lightweight title against Gilbert Melendez. He hit a lovely one of these. You jump so that you can do the full pivot without being in contact with the floor. So you can do it in a very short space. So you lose a bit of traction with the floor. You don't have the same sort of power as if you were doing the, the, you know, the Joe Rogan on the heavy bag sort of step through Kung Lee Express back kick. But you get into position and you land your strike. And if you're landing it as a counter and it's hitting a good place, you've got a great chance of hurting them anyway. You know, it's that trinity of power, placement and timing. Um, you only need like two of them to really hurt someone badly. I think surprises in this one were how great Max's chin looked. Um, you know, where in the Dustin Poirier fight, he... His hands looked like those foam hammers that make the squeaky noise. And when he got hit, he really felt it. And obviously, Dustin Poirier is a different fighter to Justin Gaethje, but Justin Gaethje is one of the hardest hitters in the lightweight division. And he landed some good shots on Holloway here. There was a lovely one where he landed the right hand on the neck, and Holloway takes it and immediately lands the left hook counter and hurts Gaethje. And again, timing and placement, more than power. But Gaethje's shot had good timing, placement, and power, and uh, Holloway took it really well. And then, uh, was it third or fourth round? Gaethje lands probably his best connection of the fight, where he does his classic combination. He, he uh, ducks whatever uh, Holloway's throwing, crashes in shoulder into Holloway's chest, and reaches his left arm behind Holloway's head. And then he just punches towards his left hand. You know, he, he used to be functionally blind in uh, in the cage and he didn't used to talk about it it was something that i was watching him going like he fights a lot like other blind fighters i've seen you know, joe frazier if you watch him back in the day by the time that he fought ali in the thriller in manila he had a cataract in one eye and he was already blind in the other and you can see it in people like that because they don't like they're not reacting to punches ever you don't want to be 
when we, when you're moving your head, there, there needs to be sort of like a degree of mo head movement in anticipation of the opponent punching to make yourself harder to hit. You don't want to be working entirely on reactions. But you can see when someone is not reacting at all to punches. They're just moving their head constantly. And, and then if the punch comes in or not, they're like, uh, it's the same. Um, and Justin Gaethje used to be like that. And he used to have his hands out feeling for the guy tons. And all his best connections were he'd grab behind the head and then he'd punch towards his hand. And a lot of the time it'd be a, a great right uppercut, but he hit Max here with a, a right hook and um, stunned him a little bit. But it's always been his best weapon. Duck in, grab the head, punch to the hand. But it would be so much better if he jabbed first, if he just jabbed and dipped and crashed into the guy then. Jab and dip for everyone. I mean, he starts jabbing in like round three or four, and he has some success with it. And this is something I'm always talking about with Duran, Roberto Duran, one of the great boxers of all time, if you're not a regular listener of the podcast or regular viewer of old boxing. But Duran fought some amazing jabbers, and his game was to get inside and hit them with power punches. And power punches are your left hook, your right hand, your, you know, your right hook, your right straight, your left uppercut. Uh, your, your body shots of both hands, but they're all shorter than the jab and they're all slower than the jab. So the jab is like whittled down to if we're going reaction for reaction as fast as possible, the guy with the better jab, if he can keep you on the outside, he's going to have a great time. Duran would be like losing these jabbing battles in terms of landing, but he would be jabbing with the opponent knowing that they jab back. So he'd jab and then they jab back or, or uh, he'd jab and he'd move his head immediately knowing that they jab back. He'd jab and duck or jab and dip and their jab would fly over the top of him and he'd be inside with their elbows open smashing their body or other times they'd jab and then he'd sort of wait a bit and then he'd jab and then they'd both wait a bit and then he knew the opponent would jab because he'd set this little rhythm up so he knew when to slip and move inside so even if your jab is not landing and you don't have the faster jab and your jab is not really that much of a weapon you can still start dictating when the opponent is going to jab and, and get on the inside and hit them with your power punches. Um, it's always good to jab. Like even if you even if your jab is absolute trash, having it out there, if you know when your trash jab is going out, you know when the opponent's going to be trying to counter. But sadly, Justin Gaethje, whose jab is not trash, still will not jab until round four. <laughs> but then this is what Ho uh, Holloway had in the Dustin Poirier fight. Didn't go to the body till like round three, round four has real success there, and you're like, well, if you just started that in round one, or round two even, um, and, and it's the same with Justin Gaethje's jab here. There was another great example of that principle we talk about all the time. Holloway's been clipping off ones and twos, or you know, two punches at a time, jab to the head, right straight to the body, or uh, one-two to the head. He does that twice in a row, and then he throws jab right straight to the body, jab right straight. Four punches, bam, 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 bam. And he chins Justin Gaethje and hurts him. That's you know until the end of the fight. That's probably the, the worst he hurt him. Uh, and, and it's something that always seems to work because so much of like the knockout and and being stunned by things. You know, a lot of it is bro science. A lot of it is old wives' tale. But for the fellas, um, but one of the, the observable trends is that you tend to get hurt by things that you're not ready for. If something surprises you that will do more damage to you and your equilibrium and your ability to continue fighting than if you're looking straight at the guy and he punches you in the face and you see it coming the whole time. Even if that shot's harder. Um, so the great example I always use is Shane Carwin versus Junior Dos Santos. Junior Dos Santos, massive hitter at heavyweight. Shane Carwin, a massive hitter and could clearly take an enormous blow. He was like, he, he cut to make 265. He was a 300 pound man. <laughs> he got caught like having HGH delivered to his house, <laughs> but he was terrifying. And Dos Santos was hitting him as hard as he could. Dos Santos body jabs right straight to the body, setting up the big overhand. That was his big move. He jabs, he jabbed the body right straight to the body and the devil change and throw the overhand across the top with like a straight arm. And he'd hit you with his wrist right behind the neck. And Shane Carmen was taking these shots. And then in the third round, Junior Dos Santos throws one, two, three, two. And Shane Cohen has been so used to like taking two punches and trying to come back that he walks straight on to the three, two immediately afterwards and gets stunned, changing up rhythm, changing up volume, really important to hurting people or stunning people. And then we can get into like the aspects of what makes the knockout shot. As we talk about the end of the fight, which was absolutely crazy. Max Holloway had come out and he put on a blinder. I think he won every round or maybe Gaethje won one. Uh, I know one judge had it like even going into the fifth and you're going, really? Um, but he, he'd put on an amazing performance. He'd 
outclassed Gaethje in basically almost every round. He'd been hit very little, and even if, even if he got hit clean, he took it, like, effortlessly. And he'd hurt this much bigger puncher. And then in the last 10 seconds of the fight, he does the thing that he did against Ricardo Lamas, who is not a big hitter and not scary like that. Where he points to the centre of the cage, he goes, let's swing. But he did it to the biggest hitter in the division. And then he stopped him and slumped him on his face in the last second of the fight. It was crazy. And tactically, probably the dumbest thing you could do if you're winning the fight already by beautiful decision. Career-wise, honestly, a very smart thing to do. The talk was previously, what, like, what's Max Holloway got left? Volkanovski beat him three times. He's never getting that fight again. Uh, Ilya Tapuri doesn't want to fight him, this, that, and the other. Uh, he's doing this weird fight at lightweight where he didn't look good last time. And now the conversation is, damn, that dude should be fighting Islam Makachev because he just scored the best knockout of all time over a guy who just knocked out the guy who Makachev's about to fight. Or if he goes down to featherweight again, oh, easy title shot because he just beat the number one contender in the weight class above by knockout. But even in that crazy exchange at the end, he gets in, he goes to the body, and then he comes up to the head again. And Gaethje's like reaching down to deal with the body shots. And, and Gaethje, you know, mouth open because he's been breathing through his nose from early on. Eyes have been closed by, uh, let's admit it, a couple of eye pokes and a ton of jabs. So perfect time to throw away the fight if you do something stupid like right at the end of the fight. But also perfect time to stop someone if they've got an iron head most of the time. And then, you know, re- end of round five is going to be the when they're most vulnerable. So I'll never say it was a good idea to step in and trade with Justin Gaethje when you've already sealed the fight. But I could understand if Max Holloway had felt his, you know, he's been being hit by him intermittently throughout the fight. If he's felt his power in the fifth round and he said, you know what, this isn't hurting me anymore. And I'm cracking him basically any time I want to. And he said, okay, let's try and knock him out. Then respect to him for that. But it did turn what was, you know, going to be remembered by people like me as one of the all-time great game plans and performances into what is now going to be remembered as one of the great fights of all time and one of the great finishes of all time by everyone or everyone in this niche sport. And then someone put the belt on him, but he went over and gave it to Mark Coleman instead. Anyway, was it what a a legend. If you've not been keeping up with the Mark Coleman stuff, the first UFC heavyweight champion uh, moved from the tournament structure to the heavyweight title structure. Great fighter back in the day, had trouble learning submissions and striking and things like that. Wasn't like great in the, all-rounded sense, a very scary fighter back in the day. But he's been in and, out, in and out of hospital basically every other week for the last five years. He's had multiple hip replacements. His spine's ruined. He can barely walk. And yet his dog woke him in the night because his house was on fire. His parents were in the house, who, you know, must be like 80 or 90 now. And he carried them both out and ran back in and passed out from uh, smoke inhalation trying to save his dog. So absolute legend. Choking up even recounting that story, but it was great to see him there and getting his props. And there was another storyline there too, because he came out with his daughters holding hands with him, which was very sweet. But they're now the age that he was when he was getting beaten up by Fedor Emelianenko and brought them into the ring to meet the guy who'd just beaten their dad up, which is one of the strange scarring moments in MMA. But um, in, in a weird way, you can sort of understand because he was like, don't be scared of this man. He's just a guy and he was just doing his job. And uh, yeah, quite touching in, in a weird way. But the, these little girls were so traumatized at the time. Man, I am going long today. Do you know what I'll do? I'll do Oliveira versus Sarukian, and then I'll do the rest on the boycast for the boys. So if you're not signed up to the Patreon, probably a great time to do that. And there's tons of stuff to read. and There's tons of stuff to listen to. But Oliveira versus Sarukian, I loved this fight. There was there were so many fights on this card where you knew it was better than anything they booked in months. Like, I was pointing out, Hinata Moicano versus Jalen Turner and Sadiq Yusuf versus Diego Lopez were better than anything that's happened in about three months as, as ter- in terms of quality of matchup. And they both delivered great fights. But, like, we've had months of these cards that just don't matter. And this, you know, would have made a great main event for an Apex card for a, a fight on the road. But they popped it down in, like, fourth from the top on this amazing card. Great fight because sarukin has been climbing the ranks forever. Lots of the top guys at lightweight are in this weird situation where they only have to fight each other. And this it's sort of the division's aging out in like the Evander Holyfield, Riddick Bowe sort of way where they fought this trilogy where they just beat the snot out of each other and didn't fight anyone else for like a couple of years. <laughs> and, then, and then the other guys started coming up and beating them up because you know, you, you've been removed in a bubble from the division for a while. And that's kind of what's happened with Gaethje and Poirier 
Um, they occasionally step back in and beat someone, but like Benoit Saint Denis was not sort of like top tier guy. He was a guy coming up, but Armand Sarukin is the real deal. He's he's here. He's ready to start surging towards title contention. And he'd been calling out Michael Chandler forever, who obviously just wants the Conor McGregor fight. He doesn't want anything else now, uh, which is so weird because he's not going to get paid any more for it. <laughs> like he's he's got a contracted amount and he doesn't get pay per view points, but um, he wants to be famous as the guy who knocked out. Conor McGregor, brackets, ignore the possible drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and being out of training for years. Um, but Sarukin finally managed to get a top guy to fight him, and it was Charles Oliveira who... Do you know what was crazy? People saw that cut Oliveira suffered that stopped the Makachev rematch, and they were like, oh, Oliveira's ducking. Like, when has Oliveira ducked anyone? He's absolutely not scared of losing. He's not scared of getting like knocked out on his face. The dude has... No fear of the repercussions of his incredibly hard fight career. But this turned out, this was, you know, Max Holloway versus Justin Gaethje had so much great techers, but it also had that nutty ending for the the casual just bleed guy in all of us. This one was was largely pure techers and it was great fun. Um, I think largely it came down to the issue that Charles Oliveira, while he's worked on his wrestling knots and he's getting much better, the better wrestler always ends up on top and, you know, top time really does factor into these things. There were a couple of close submission attempts in this fight. There was some fun striking. And then there was some nerd shit that I'm going to get into about, like, just no-gi controls that I thought were really interesting. Charles Oliveira must spend a lot of time underneath people asking them to hit him in, in training because he comes up with things that you don't see other people do. But very early on, Charles Oliveira gets the... Uh, Catches uh, Zarukin coming in low, catches the guillotine. Really weird thing because I'm like, he must have done this on purpose, but I've not seen really anyone do it. If you go back and watch that guillotine, Armin Zarukin's trying to fight off the hands and there is a hand just floating in front of his face. And you're going, whose hand is that? And you realize it's Charles Oliveira's. Because where you normally grab the guillotine and the hand that's around the neck, you grab that with your other hand and you pull it up into the neck or you squeeze it up into the neck. You have your choking hand and a supporting hand. In this choke, Charles Oliveira wrapped with his choking hand and then grabbed his other arm with his choking hand. So his support hand was just sort of hanging and he was holding onto his forearm with the choking hand, which was very interesting. Because, you know, I've seen him finish lots of different chokes. His guillotine, he tends to do sort of an old school Luta Livre style where rather than trying to get the edge of the bone, so like look at your wrist, and the thumb side of it, the inside, that sharp bit is what a lot of people try and get into the throat. He does an S grip, which is where you curl your fingers into each other. And that puts the the part that your watch is on, the face of your watch, into their throat. So you've got a wider thing going into their throat. So it's not, you know, if, you're, if you're worried about like pressure and surface area, you don't have as much of a choke. But it's really good if you've got messed up wrists. But this one, I've, I've never seen anyone attempt to choke like this. Uh, Nick, sorry, Nate Diaz used to do a weird one where he used uh, the web of his hand facing upwards to like hand choke people in the guillotine. But uh, yeah, it was really interesting because it looked fairly tight and Armin Sarukian was reaching for the choking hand and getting the hand that was just sort of hanging there and going, what on earth is this? But Sarukian fought his way out. Hedda Gracie said it was because his, his shorts kept falling down and that stopped Oliver from finishing it. Um, there was a close uh, triangle arm bar. Was that near the end of the second round? I don't know. It's, it was close, but I think because he'd heard the clapper, Armin Sarukin was not tremendously worried about it. Um, but in those sort of situations, yeah, and Charles Oliveira did try this, you might as well just try and break their arm because if you can pop their elbow and then you're in round three and you're striking a guy who's got an arm that's only sort of working, that's always good. The thing that I loved about Charles Oliveira's guard in this one, he was looking for overhooks a lot. A lot of the time he looks for, uh, he gets a hand inside the thigh and starts throwing up arm bars and things like that. But Armin Sarukin, if you saw him against Joel Alvarez, he is a monster on top. He stays low and he hits with elbows very well in a short space. And Charles Oliveira was going for overhooks. Now, an underhook is where your arm goes underneath the opponent's arm and you get like your shoulder underneath their armpit. And, and that's great for coming up. So like on a single leg from half guard or using butterfly hooks to, to build up. Overhooks you see more, well, think of the standing clinch. In wrestling, people are trying to get underhooks. Overhooks you see more in boxing because people wrap over the arm. You go over their arm and you uh, you pinch it under your armpit, basically. 
And in boxing, you bring your glove in between your chest and your opponents, and that ties up the arm and makes it very hard for them to hit you. So boxing, you see tons of double overhooks, which you don't see in wrestling because it's not really a very good position because you've given the other guy double underhooks. But a lot of arrows grabbing overhooks and double overhooks from the guard, from the guard to stop Sarukian elbowing. And then Sarukian pulls one elbow free, folds it over and elbows Charles Oliveira in the face. But his hand is still in the middle of Charles Oliveira's chest. And Charles Oliveira grabs it like he's doing the hand-on-heart Roman Empire or, or an American National Anthem thing. Uh, and he grabs the wrist that way. And then he gets his other hand... And then he's got the overhook on the other side too. So he brings his hands across and locks them together. And then he gets his feet in and butterfly sweeps from there. And he's able to get back up to his feet. And it's a really cool control that I've never really seen. Pinning the guy's wrist to your chest like that with the hand on heart grip. Uh, and it only worked because Sarukin had freed his arm just enough to land the elbow. But that's something I'm stealing and trying. There was another one later on where he was in half guard and Sarukin had hit him with a good elbow that cut him open. And you could see that Charles was like, I don't want to get hit again for a minute. Oliveira reaches around Sarukian's cross-facing arm, which is the one we're always saying keep off. Left hand under, right hand over. And he locks his hands in what's sometimes called like a, a vice grip or a bolt cutter. And he just clamps them down over Sarukian's uh, bicep and pulls his head into Sarukian's pec. And I'm looking at it going, that's got to be really annoying because you can't really like punch across in front of your own pec with your free hand. And, you know, if you wanted to, you could probably squeeze up on that arm and make it hurt. It's not going to finish any fights, but I'm stealing that to try and grappling. And it made it sort of impossible for Sarukin to do anything. A couple of cool striking moments. Uh, Sarukin, obviously very famous for his left kick, loves his one-two step up left kick. And Oliveira very early on times a right kick to the standing leg as Sarukin steps up for the left kick, gets the cut kick and knocks Sarukin to the ground. And as we talked about in, uh, you know, in high level fights, wrestling Sarukin to the floor is hard work. You watch Matuj Gamrot fail that for five rounds. Timing a kick on his standing leg gives you a free knockdown. And if you stand, you, if you uh, pressure in on top of him, you've got a great chance of holding him down or at least making him work to get up. Cut kicks are unbelievably money in MMA and you barely ever see them. And then Tarukin did a nice thing where he threw a, a combination with his hands. I think it was left, straight, right uppercut. And then he pushed Charles Oliveira's forehead with his left hand and stepped up into the body kick with his left leg. I thought that was gorgeous. That's what, this is the thing. We're always moaning about the gloves. We're always moaning about the eye pokes. Eye pokes are really annoying. The two that Max Holloway put in in the fight with Gaethje, you know, that is enough to change a fight. They should have taken a point from him at that point doesn't matter if it's uh, intentional or not, if your fingers are going in the guy's eyes. But I always want fighters to be able to push off the face because it is, there are some really cool things you can do with it. So it's a tricky spot. We need gloves that like encourage the hand to curl and then that doesn't stop eye pokes, but it removes deniability. So you can say you, you, had, to ha you, you had to make effort to straighten your fingers out towards the opponent's eyes there. And you start docking points all the time. But that involves the UFC making a glove that actually does that. And the new glove that they're advertising doesn't have a word about like encouraging a, the, the fist to be pulled or the shape of the glove encouraging a fist. And you'd also have to have the refs on board. And they just won't. They're like, if you do that again, you're getting a hard warning. And then there was the super dope axe kick from uh, Armin Sarukian, which as close to a combat effective axe kick as I've seen since Andy Hook died. Uh, we, we say it every time, but there's one man who's ever effectively used the axe kick, and it was Andy Hoog. And the secret to that was that like he deadlifted, had these enormous hamstrings, uh, so that he didn't get injured. There, there's such a difference between Andy Hoog's axe kick and like the taekwondo axe kick where you land with the flat of the foot, and it's just like brushing the opponent's face. And if you actually hit their shoulder, you'd hyperextend your own knee because you've got little twiggy legs. Um, you know, you need horse thighs and you need uh, like a lifetime of that weird cushion sparring that gives you incredible leg dexterity and flexibility. And we're never going to see it again. We're never seeing another fighter like Andy Hook. If, you've, if you are new to this podcast because it's UFC 300 and you're a combat sports noob, look up Andy Hook right now because you've got a new favorite fighter. A-N-D-Y, hug like you would give someone. I was about to say A-N-D-Y because I got her. Because uh, Charles Oliveira, he, he looks like the mask and he actually dressed like the mask for the weigh-in, which was great. There was some debate over the um, 
scoring of this fight because there were a couple of close submissions. Oh, sorry, the DAS, I forgot to mention. And people going like, he's out, he's out in the DAS. And there was an instance in uh, Zhang Wei Li versus Yan Jiao Nan where the girl was pretty much obviously had been unconscious briefly and then woke up and was stumbling back to her corner. Um, no, Armin Sarukin was never close to out in this one, uh, in the DAS. If you, when you see a guy go belly down and, and straight out like that in the DAS, starfishing is a totally legit defense to the DAS. It doesn't defend you from some other things. You know, it's, it does, it's kind of like the getting on your knees to avoid the knee, you know, to stop the guy kneeing you in the head. But you can't, you could frown on it and be like, oh, that's pussy shit. But their hands are locked up tight in that DAS. They have to unlock them to go and do anything else. They, if they want to run around to your back or whatever. And if you watch that um, front headlock sequence early on, Charles is trying to go between the choke and running around behind Sarukin. And Sarukin is like low to the floor, shoulders shrugged, turtled up so that the choke's hard to get. And he's got one arm out so that Oliveira can't run around behind him. So Oliveira is trying to like step high over his arm. And there's about 30 seconds of that playing out. These are good high-level grapplers. But yes, so if you starfish out, keeps your shoulder away from your neck, gives you some space to breathe, gives you some space to, well, not breathe, stop the blood from being stopped going to your brain. But yeah, Oliveira spent long enough on the ground not attacking that uh, and taking elbows that I think you, you are fair to score those rounds for Sarukian. Um, but even in that last round, you saw the, the old tactical misstep that we keep talking about all the time. When you're behind someone in the turtle... You can hit them, you're in control, you're okay. When you start getting on their back, everything can go wrong very quickly. Because if they roll onto, if they roll back so that you're underneath them, you've lost all your strikes, you have nothing. You're just looking for the choke while on their back. If they tripod up and you miss your hooks or you don't have underhooks on their upper body, you can slide over the top and they come out the back door. And that's how uh, Oliveira got out from underneath him and in an instant was on that dance. The example I always give is Tiago Moises versus Islam Makachev. Tiago Moises gets behind Makachev in the first round, along the cage, jumps to get on Makachev's back and falls over the top of him. Makachev gets behind Tiago Moises in the back body lock in every round of that fight from then on and only gets on his back in like round four, round five when it's, when it's time to finish. He's instead tripping him to the mat, beating him up, if, beating him up from the turtle, letting him get back up, tripping him to the mat. Getting on people's backs, real dangerous. But I reckon that'll do us for today. I'll be back on Wednesday, Thursday to talk about the rest of this card. It was banger. I'll try and edit something together with the footage from um, Oliveira versus Sarukin to, to show those cool things that I liked and put that on the YouTube. If you want to sign up to the Patreon, get in on the boycast and be a boy, do that. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. If you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Back to the apex and Anthony Smith's body double. Can't even get Anthony Smith for this Apex event. Bless.